We're in the middle of a series called Hearing Aids, uh, looking at life rhythms and habits that can help nurture and nourish us spiritually. Uh, Life rhythms, if you will, that help spiritually self-feed. But they also position and posture us more receptively so that we can both hear and respond to the voice of God in our lives. And so week number one, we talked a bit about the importance of God's written word, that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the written word of God, which reveals, we would say, not just the story of God, but also the heart and the character of our Father. And last week, we were looking at prayer. Uh, God is, Jesus sent his followers this gift of the Holy Spirit, who can speak to us through God's written word, but who can also speak to us, I, I want to say maybe more subjectively, but in the posture of prayer. Sometimes it's the prick of our conscience. Sometimes it's uh, a quiet nudging of direction, a peace that comes over us as we, as we think about a certain step we need to take. Uh, God can speak to us both more objectively, if you will, through Scripture. He can also speak to us somewhat more subjectively uh, as we posture ourselves to pray. The, the thing I want to start by just saying, and this morning's a bit of a, a course corrective for all of this. Uh, course corrective isn't the right word. Bear with me. It'll make sense, I hope. What I want to say is this. God can speak to us But just because we're in God's word doesn't always mean we're hearing God as clearly as we should. Uh, And I had somebody send me the following quote from Brooklyn-born, man, pastor of New Life Fellowship, uh, Rich Villadis. Can you fire this for me, Paul? After I preached the first sermon, it's a wonderful reminder. Uh, And he just says the following. He says, unless we read scripture through the lens of the crucified Christ. Now, that's a very specific way of coming to the text. That's not a given. And then also, he says, with others. If we don't do this, our exegesis, now if you're not a pastoral student, that's a complicated word, but it just means the conclusions that we draw from the scripture we read will be dangerously subject to some of our personal preferences and political allegiances. So what you and I need the reminder that just because we're in God's word doesn't guarantee that we're hearing God clearly, as much as I believe this to be absolutely valuable. Sometimes our filter is a little clogged because all of us have this kind of sinfulness and selfishness that just kind of permeates a little bit of everything we do and how we kind of want God to come to us. So what can happen is, and this can happen both in in prayer as well as in Scripture, is that instead of us being slowly conformed to the image of Christ, we take the message of Christ, and we conform him more and more to look like us. And and what starts to happen is Jesus has all the same friends that we do, and he cheers for the same hockey team, and he votes for the same political party, and he has exactly the same views of COVID. And and we start to realize, oh, no, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I've made Jesus a lot more like me than I've been made into the image of Jesus. Now, that's a little bit of a discouraging thing. We go like, if we have this ability, or sorry, a propensity towards having a bit of a clogged filter in the way that we hear God, both as we read scripture and as we pray, how, what are some checks and balances for unclogging that? Uh, and as a way of just setting the table for why I think, I, not a course correction, but a, it, it's worth a, a conversation this morning. I don't know if you've ever bumped into somebody who uses the following expression, and it is one of the most intriguing and terrifying statements all at the same time, and you will occasionally bump into people and they will tell you, God told me, punk, and they'll drop whatever in front of you. Now, it's intriguing because through his spirit, God speaks through his word and God speaks through prayer. This might be entirely true. And we actually need to nod our heads and go, this is absolutely possible. We need to to listen up to what they might be saying, right? But God told me, makes a massive assumption, and that is that our filter is so clean that we are hearing it exactly right. I had a friend in high school who was convinced that God told him he was supposed to marry a certain girl. Unfortunately, God never also made this clear to her. And so he had to settle to be happily married to somebody else later on in life. But I want to introduce you to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, Last week we were in the Gospel of John, uh, speaking of the importance, through prayer in particular, of staying connected to the vine, to the source of life, to Jesus Christ. Uh, in that same section of verses, John describes the gift of the Holy Spirit. He describes him as the spirit of truth, the one who will guide us into all truth. Uh, and you and I hear that, and the temptation is for us to go, the spirit guides us into all truth. Therefore, I'm hearing God exactly right. But what we discover, in, uh, and I'm just jumping to one of John's letters, but First John chapter 4, same author, by the way, he's writing a letter to some churches in Asia Minor, and he says the following here. 
Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. Because, and here I'm paraphrasing, not everybody who says God told me is actually right. Now, we tend to assume that when somebody uses an expression like that, God told me, that they're being intentionally deceitful, but that's, that might not be the case. They might genuinely believe this is the voice of God, but it might be a partial voice of God, uh, and this is what a clogged filter can kind of do to us. So God speaks to us through his word, and God speaks to us through prayer. What I, I can't remember where I first heard this analogy, but this morning I just want to be really practical. And I'll credit Henry Blackaby, who's a Saskatchewan-based pastor. He goes back a little bit. But for those of you who've ever bumped into like his book or workbook, Hearing God, really practical read on how you and I can hear and respond to God. Uh, the analogy is this. When it comes to hearing the voice of God, you and I would do really well to look for uh, at least a three-legged stool before trusting our weight to it. Does that make sense? Now, I don't know whether your balance is substantially better than mine, but trusting my weight to a one-legged stool is not something I'm very excited about. This is, this is a recipe for things going really badly, really quickly, okay? However, I don't know about you, I don't want to really trust my life to a two-legged stool either. I can't fall in any direction, but I don't want to try sitting on a two-legged stool at the top of a staircase, for example. Because there are still several ways that this could end really badly. And the suggestion was just when it comes to the voice of God in our lives, we would do really well to have some checks and balances. And I want to just give you a sense of what I think at least three of these could be. And we've talked about one, and here's where I'm just retracing. But God's spirit speaks to us through his written word. Reveals not just the story, the character, the heart of our Father. More importantly, we would say, despite the fact that much of Scripture is written to a first century audience, the good news for you and for me is that God doesn't change. And so the essence of his story can still be applied to our lives in a very different culture and context. And so one of the great first legs that we can test with is, you know, if, if what God told me or what I feel God's saying to me or what somebody tells me God is telling them to, is not lining up with what is revealed of God in Scripture, that we're, we're like, ah, no, I'm bumping into issues here that this seems wrong with. We've already got one check and balance that we'd say, no, um, that doesn't sound right. And prayer becomes another one. There's a sense that God, whether it's, uh, and I was saying, like whether it's the nudge in our conscience, whether it's that sense of peace as we kind of come to grips with a decision we need to make, um, whether it is a direction that he seems to reveal, it's much more subjective, but it's no less real that the Holy Spirit can speak to us this way. Uh, and we tend to, as MBs, be sometimes referred to as people of the book. We, we prefer the first leg of the stool, if you will, uh, and our Pentecostal friends have a bit of a, a propensity towards the second. They have something that we don't in this case. I share this to say both of these are powerful legs and I don't know that in and of themselves, I'd want to fully trust my weight to that. And so this morning, I want to just, this is a third leg. It's not the only one, but it is one of the ones that I think you and I should consider. And if you get nothing else from this morning, the big idea this morning is this. God speaks to us through the faith community. I, I, we have this tendency, I think it's because our culture is so individualistic. We tend to take this and we go, God speaks to me, and I pray, and God speaks to me, and it's so good, and it's so true, but we tend to forget if God speaks to me, he also speaks to you, and to you, and to you, and to you, which means as we interact with each other, the possibility is that we hear from the Holy Spirit as we engage with other Jesus followers. And it becomes a wonderful corrective step. Back to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, test the spirits. These opening six verses of 1 John chapter 4, the pronoun you is plural in Greek throughout all of it. So again, j just to give you a sense, this is how we read our Bible. I should test the spirits. <laughs> Actually, that's not what he's saying. He said the, the role of testing the spirits is for all of you. All of you together are to weigh and see if this actually feels like the voice of God that's speaking. Hearing God's voice and discerning it is the job of the gathered faith community. And I love that. And it's such a powerful corrective when, again, when scripture and with prayer and there's a sense of 
head nodding from the community that's wrestled with this, suddenly now you have a stool that you are much safer to trust your weight and life decisions to than just some of the one or two. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but we need to pause for a minute and we need to celebrate with you guys. I was thinking we were singing... Uh, second song in, lay me down, right? I'm not my own, I belong to you. It will be my joy to say, your will, your way, always. This is exactly, we will do this imperfectly, don't get me wrong, but this is exactly the commitment that we get to celebrate this morning. So let me get out of the way so we can party with you guys. Great. Thank you, Andrew, for introducing this community section of the sermon. This is what this is about, walking together as a community and getting baptized is one of those things. Uh, Elijah, you ended your testimony with Romans, uh, with a verse from Romans that said, the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah. And so I hear three things there. Sin, it's not going to amount to anything good. Second is, this is a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. And it's only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you have Jesus Christ as the, uh, do you declare Jesus Christ as the, your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you trust him with your future, the rest of your days? Yes. This is good because Jesus likes to walk with you no matter what's going on, whatever mess is going on. He loves to walk with us for every one of our days. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you can put your hand there. That's right, sorry. Right on. It's all right. It's all good. Uh, because of what you've declared, because of what you said here today, mm-hmm. Elijah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Water is really nice and warm, Caleb. Come on in. So, Elijah, make sure you're coming around the corner. Just make sure you don't miss out on Caleb here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. He's just going to recover. That's good. I love it. I love it, you guys. Uh, Caleb, in your testimony, you mentioned uh, Colossians. And uh, I know Michelle Westner has a verse, uh, and the custodians here of, of our church, they have that verse on the wall over there that says, whatever we're doing, we're doing it for the Lord as, as if we're working for the Lord. And that's what you mentioned was hitting your heart as you were, uh, as you were working this summer and throughout the fall, uh, some of those hot, hot, hot days. Remember when there was actually hot, hot days? And then now you're out there in the snow. It's really, really cold, cold, cold days. And so you're working hard out there. So you got to, yeah, this is a great verse to have. So do you trust Jesus with every day present in the future as well? Yes. Do you declare that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes. Caleb, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't mind being interrupted for a party like that. That's good stuff. Speaking of the role of community in hearing God's voice, and that we've intentionally said at the outset, this is kind of, we live in a low-calorie society, and we just said this is a, a, a calorie-light version of teaching. Uh, so I'm glancing over passages because I want to spend time making this more practical than, than otherwise, and we'll get back to, to chewing hard into Scripture because we love to do that here. But I want to reference three passages in the book of Acts. Acts is the story of the kind of how the Jesus movement gets off the ground. We sometimes refer to this as a story of the early church. And I want to just reference three, I would almost call them watershed moments in the church. These are significant moments that the church has to wrestle to decide how are we going to respond or move. And all of these happen in the context of community. I'm not going to read them, but I'll I'll have them on screen. I'll encourage those of you in small groups to be reading into those this week and kind of digging into them. But if you want to just take a look, you're welcome to also follow along with me. The first takes place in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, the church has to respond to its first external threat, and that is persecution. Peter and John have just been arrested. The Jewish kind of religious authorities have made it very clear, and in no uncertain terms, they are to stop talking publicly about Jesus, and that's or else (laughs) kind of a thing. And so significant issue for them to have to wrestle with. What's interesting to me is 
we don't find them making a decision on their own. What should you and I do? But it's not what they do. In fact, it says they go, and I'm at verse, my eyes are a little bit blurry this morning. I want to say verse 23. They go back to their own people. We don't know if this is a small group like of church leadership, or whether this might be a larger faith family. But the point is, the decision is not made in isolation. They go back to their people to process and wrestle with how should we respond to this situation. And if you keep reading, the community moves to a time of prayer. And in the context of prayer, Scripture comes to mind that feels like it has bearing on this subject. And it's offered. In fact, this is recorded in Acts chapter 4. And the community comes through this with a strong sense of affirmation. You know what? This is one of those moments where we need to continue talking about Jesus regardless of the possible consequences of this. But it's one of these wonderful little snapshot moments where you actually find all three of the legs of the stool that we were just talking about. We find prayer, we find scripture, and we find it's the community that's wrestling together to arrive at the decision. Fast forward, Acts chapter 13. There's this wonderful little kind of three-verse story. And again, you're welcome to just look at those opening three verses if you want. This is the first missions venture intentionally launched by a, a local congregation. And what we're told is, in the context of worship and fasting, God's voice is heard in the community. We're not told how. It's one of those wonderful questions I would love to ask. Like, did everybody just go, hey, that was God? Uh, It references teachers and prophets, so it wouldn't surprise me if what happens is, in in a season and a time where the congregation is pressing into and searching to, to listen to and be responsive and receptive to what God might say, that somebody stands up and says, man, I just, I really feel like this is something we need to consider, and kind of tables it for the congregation. What's interesting to me is that it's both in the context of worship and fasting that God's voice is heard, but it implies that it's in the ongoing context of worship and fasting that the right response is also processed, that it's not just in isolation. And I'd love to know, so how many days did you wrestle with this? Was this a week? Was this several months? We're, We're given a snapshot of this. But, and it's a significant thing, the church is basically asked, this is, this is the word of the Lord that came to this congregation, I want you to release your two best pastors because I want them to serve elsewhere. It's, it's not an easy thing generally for a congregation to go, oh, well, absolutely. I'd be concerned if they said yes. But, <laughs> but in this case, like, the, the congregation presses into this so that they feel there's... A, an, There's no alternative. It's so clear to them, this is the voice of God, they have to release them. Uh, And by the way, if you have your Bibles open, what I find really, really interesting, and I love this, is that in verse 3, it says that uh, they were sent, the church sends them on their way, right? But in verse 4, it says, as they they were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. So, So which is it? Were they sent on their way by the congregation? Were they sent on their way by the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, yes. God's voice was heard and understood through the community so that you you don't differentiate between those. God's Holy Spirit also speaks through the faith community. Uh, This is one of those examples. Scripture isn't specifically referenced in this very short three-verse account, but you have prayer specifically mentioned, as well as the sense that this was a community-based decision. Uh, If you want, you can also flip a few pages. I'll just reference Acts chapter 15, and then I, because I want to create some space for story, we're going to invite some people up to share some stories. Acts chapter 15 is the church's first response to internal conflict, if you will. And I'm trying to think of the best way to share this in short form without reading 35 verses. Christianity is a new faith, but it has Jewish roots. And and if you wanted to convert to Judaism in the ancient world... There was a lot of rules, laws, regulations that you were going to have to, festivals that you were going to now be a part of. And if you were a guy, there was perhaps some medical procedures that you would also say, okay, mm, be a little uncomfortable, but we'll, we'll go there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can look it up. But one of the significant issues that arises in the early church is exactly how Jewish do Gentile converts have to become for us to consider them part of the family? And I've read this story, I'm sure, many times, and I've always somehow in my head understood that the conflict is between kind of Paul and Barnabas, who are the voice of, you know, reason, 
And actually, I've always kind of understood it to be that there was a Jewish faction outside of the church that was just being a negative influence, but that's actually not what the text says. It says there are believers who belong to the group of the Pharisees that just had a much more conservative view. And, and it's so contentious. It says a sharp dispute and debate arose. Sounds a little like COVID. Too soon? Yes, too soon. Okay. But the point is, it's a strong and contentious subject within the faith community, and there are polarizing views on it. In fact, it's such a significant dispute or debate that it's not going to be resolved in the local church. They need to call a summit meeting back in Jerusalem in order to kind of wrestle with this. And, and I love this. So again, I'm just flying by. We're again, we're given a snapshot in scripture of this. I don't know whether this summit lasted for days. We're not told, right? What we're told is Paul and Barnabas have a chance to stand up and share their case. Here's what we've seen God doing in and amongst this Gentile congregation, this church plant. It's so good. You guys need to hear this. But the voice of the opposition is given the opportunity to speak. Hey, guys, we have a much more conservative view on this. By the way, we love what God is doing, and we think there should be some really staunch rules and regulations that they follow. Uh, both views are given a chance to be shared, and the community wrestles with this. And again, like I said, it's short-formed so that one of the more influential leaders eventually gets up and speaks, James, and it's understood that it's his perspective that becomes kind of the voice of, I think this is the right way to go. And I'm sure the conversation was far more colorful than what we're given. But James stands up. He quotes, by the way, from the Old Testament prophet, I want to say Amos. Uh, and, and the essence of the quotation implies, you know what? God's plan was always to include Gentile people in his faith family. And so maybe if that was always true, we probably shouldn't get too involved in making restrictions that make it hard for them to do this. And it becomes this decision. I would love to know how colorful that conversation was and how long it lasted. But it gets to the spot that there's un I don't consensus at the very least. So that as this group drafts a letter to go back to the church, you can let the people back in Antioch know, here's our decision on the matter, that they, they write their decision this way. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Fascinating. God's voice was understood to be heard in the, and processed in the context of community. This is an example where prayer isn't specifically mentioned, but we find scripture and the community wrestle to, to do this. I, I, I love this, and I just that's kind of the big idea for this morning. God speaks through the faith community, and if you want a three-legged stool to process things on, it is much more solid with several legs. And I'll do some application, but I want to invite a, couple, a few couples to join me. Richard and Hazel, Dwayne and Irma, come hang out with me for a little bit up here on stage. I would love to give you the opportunity to perhaps share a story or two of some of your experience with hearing God's voice in the context of community. Now, yeah, come make yourselves at home. Um, I'll give you mics. Dwayne and Irma, as well as Richard and Hazel, are perhaps a little bit unique in that both of them have experienced as pastoral couples, which, let's move this out of the way. Hearing God's voice in community, by the way, does not have to be something that's restricted to pastors in any kind of a way, shape, or form. When other people, and it can be a small group of friends, speak into your life, this is no less the voice of God if, if there's a sense of discernment and agreement that comes from it. But you folks will have some unique experience. So actually, I don't know if you're sharing very personally or much more corporately, but I wanted to just begin, uh, and it doesn't matter to me who wants to start off here, but do you have a story of a time that you can recall really kind of where the voice of God was heard, whether it was personally like of other people speaking into your life and situation or family or a time where collectively or corporately as a faith family, as a church that you were a part of, you remember a time that you would point back to and say, you know what, we heard the Holy Spirit through this moment. Uh, Richard and Hazel, I'll maybe start with you. But do you, do you have a story that you might be willing to share on this subject? Okay, I'll go way back here to West Portal times in the 80s. Boom. I had already been in Europe twice, once as a single and once as a young couple. And we're back in uh, Saskatoon, went to university, teaching high school. Already sensed within me, um, and Hazel also, we need to go back to Europe or back into missions. So on a Sunday morning, I had preached here in West Portal and I was walking out and Selma Johnson, Len and Selma, some of you may remember them, 
tapped me on the shoulder and says, Richard, you belong in the ministry and not in the classroom. Hmm. I taught her kids excellent students, loved teaching them. But that was at a time where I sensed God was nudging me again. Nice. Hazel. Uh, talk about community. I, the first thing I was thinking about was family as community. Yeah. And continuing from what Richard said, I think what was important to us then and where we appreciated our mission so much, they actually gave us a, bo a book to work through with our kids. And we worked with our children. They were six, eight, or seven, and ten at that time. And this was talking about us going. And they spoke into whether they were ready to go to another country. Hmm. And I remember us working through that as a family and what it did for us. I remember lying in front of the fireplace evenings, reading this book with the kids, praying with them. And I remember one of our boys said, but I don't want to leave my friends. I don't want to go. And we prayed with him. We prayed alone. And one day he came to me and he said, Mom, I think I've found the solution. I can always write him a letter. You know, those were days before we had emails. <laughs> and, and that, to us, was such an encouragement. And so I think as a family, it was wonderful to see our kids involved in the decision. Of course, they were still yeah. young, but they were still pulled into it. And that, I see that as a community. That's fantastic. Dwayne and Irma. All right. Thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit here. Uh, I think we fit into that uh, second group as well, probably the same as Richard and Hazel here. And uh, I'll tell a story when Herb and I were around 30, which sure. is not that long ago. And uh, we were moving from... Just Edmonton, a couple of years, I expect. <laughs> we were moving from British Columbia to, to Edmonton, Alberta. Right. And we had just experienced what I guess we would call today a burnout okay. experience. It wasn't uh, a happy time. Yeah. And we decided to move to Edmonton, and we started to uh, attend a church over there. And our idea in moving to Edmonton was to start a fencing business. Okay. And uh, we called ourselves the Neighborhood uh, Carpenters. That was awesome. We did this together. We were both part of this. But we needed a break from our position as pastor, and we also needed some serious healing. Hmm. The church we started to attend was the Lender Memby Church in Edmonton. It was a downtown church that soon, we soon found out was trying to grapple with the idea of whether they should plant a church or not. Hmm. And it was just a weird experience because we sat around that church and they talked and talked and talked and talked, meeting after meeting, same question. And they were not coming to any solution. And we thought that was a bit odd. Uh, so after we had attended some of the discernment gatherings, which is what they called them to. It was always after the service in the morning. Okay. Um, we began to think more about our uh, fencing business, and we moved to a new part of the city on the very east side. Uh, we were feeling very free and fulfilled in our partnership in that uh, fence building business. Lots of neighbors, lots of friends. Yep and dug into the community. That winter, we took a trip to California to, for a break, and because we were healing up a little bit, we started to check out the seminary down there. And one day the phone rang when we were over there, and it was the Lindrum discernment team calling to say that they were seeing our move to Edmonton as a possible answer to their prayers for a pastor in the new part of a city where we were living, and they were wondering if we would think about being part of that. And we said, not a chance. Yeah, we like fencing. So they said, whoa, just a minute. Will you take time to think and pray about this? Ah. The two big questions. Boom. So we did a little thinking and a little prayer, and that was where we left it for the moment. And uh, how can you say no to a request like that? When we returned from California, we agreed to join them with their discernment team, and we shared our pain, our feelings of inadequacy, and our loneliness. And they listened. 
And uh, this is all from our past experience. So uh, after a few more church discernment meetings, they came up with an idea. And they said, okay, we want you guys here to be sure to listen to what we have to say. Uh, what would happen if you guys would be bivocational and our present pastor would be bivocational and the two of you uh, could become partners and this present pastor who is quite a bit older than you could be your mentor and your coach for possibly up to five years. Huh. And we said, whoa, this is really something. Really? And uh, that would be more than we could ask or even dream for. Right. Uh, that's what we did, and our, possession, our passion and love for church planting really took hold during those five years. Ten years later, uh, we went back to the seminary where that first phone call came from, and uh, we began the discernment process with the team over there where we should find ourselves in the next era of ministry, which turned out to be in West Portal. Go figure. So that was a very awesome experience. That was a long, what's great about that is it's a long, slow process of discernment. We often think that God's voice should be like a quick right angle in the way that we hear. Like it should be an obvious, well, then do this, and this is how we should respond. But in this case, it was a slow discernment. Uh, small steps that continue to, to show that God's hand was in it, and sometimes that confirmation would come along for the ride. Irma, do you have something to add? I'll, I'll answer. We'll go to the next question. Sure. I wanted to ask, what are, what's one hurdle that we maybe need to think about overcoming in order to engage more or listen to, to hear God's voice in community? And I think there are hurdles and obstacles for this. Um, actually, I think one of the things that happens is we often jump to our own plans too quickly. Uh, we just go ahead with what we decided to do. Right. Our fencing business was doing very well. Dwayne was paying me really big bucks, and it was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> also, I think one other thing is we don't trust the Holy Spirit to line up people and events. Uh, that the Holy Spirit actually lines these things up, and sometimes we don't think of that and we don't trust it. I think mm -hmm. that's one thing, or two things, two sure. obstacles or hurdles. Yeah. Richard and Hazel, from your opinion, what's one or two hurdles you think we need to overcome oh, to hear there's, God's voice better? There's lots of hurdles, and they're about as diverse as there are people. I think everybody's <laughs> got one. Uh, what I've seen in ministry, what I've seen is personal pride, Ego gets in the way. Nobody else is going to tell me what to do. Likewise, there's timidity, there's shyness, not willing to share one's vision with others, um, not wanting to be vulnerable, a distrust of others, uh, them speaking, and that's not being known, not being able to trust. Hmm. Hazel, anything Richard. to add? Richard said it. Boom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Last question. Last question. What is one word of encouragement or a practical tip that you might offer someone thinking of growing or taking intentional steps towards, man, I, wanna, I want to hear God's voice in the context of community? The, fir the first thing that came to my mind is learning to listen to each other hmm. and asking good questions. I think those are one of the main things of uh, learning to listen to what the other person is really saying, and not just to say what you think right away, sure. but listening to them from your heart. Okay. Richard, anything to add? Yeah, perhaps out of my own story, I would say practice sincere, uh, honest shoulder tapping. Uh, don't just begin with community, stay with community, hmm. um, because even though we may get started on a track, it's not always going to be easy, and we need each other. Yeah. Dwayne? Pretty simple. Listen till the room gets quiet. <laughs> this was the most fascinating experience for us. Lendrum is a very, uh, I don't know if it still is, but quite academic, lots of university professors, etc., in that church. And uh, they were talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And, 
and all at once at one meeting, everything just got quiet, and it was like nobody had anything more to say, and it there was a consensus, mm. and so learn to to uh, listen until the room gets quiet. Yeah, is how we put it, and I think another word of encouragement is be honest with your own struggles and your own inadequacies, mm. and I think you've mentioned that too, Richard and Hazel, where. So often, I think we want to just put on this good front. Um, and, and there may be nothing wrong with that, but I think there's the community is to be a place of transparency. And I think that that's a word of encouragement for us. If, you're, if you've got a big decision to make, be honest. I'm, I'm scared. I don't feel adequate, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, learn to be honest. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of this. Can, as a congregation, can we say thank you to them for, for sharing from your stories, from your experience? Here, I'll take the mic. I'm grateful for that. We learn often from the experience of others, every, well, more so than you probably learn from teaching. When the room gets quiet, I assume usually I've said something out of place, so. <laughs> Which you know happens way too frequently. <laughs> Uh, we need to make this uh, appropriate here, uh, uh, applicable. I still, and, and I'll add a few things, uh, but these really, I'm not, I'm going to piggyback a lot of what was already shared. What was great was I actually didn't know in advance what you folks were going to share, and you didn't know what I was going to say. Here are four application steps. You want to take practical steps into faith community in ways that you can hear God's voice better and richer. I, we don't actually have time to talk about this. It was an image that we used this past fall to talk about the importance of, sure, leave it up there for 30 seconds. You want to hear God's voice well? This is kind of has to do with that issue of discipleship. We do this best in a context where the relationship is very high. You are known, but there's a high level of trust. They use the word invitation. But also where you are loved too much just to kind of be parroted to. <laughs> they will actually speak words of perspective into your life that maybe sometimes aren't always our favorite to hear. And the four steps I have here for application, really you'll see me walking up into that kind of upper right, right quadrant as we do. Here's the first one. Fire it for me, Paul. You and I need Christian community that actually knows us. You want to hear, for, hear God's voice? You actually need people that know you, which means the, you have to press into relationships. And someone said in the panel here, over the long haul, you have to stay in community. There's a reason, by the way, that family so often speaks most insightfully into your and my life because they know us most intimately. They know when we're being lazy. They know when we're faking it. They know when we're going through the motions. You name it, right? And family loves you too much to actually let you get away with that. And so they, we sometimes don't want to be known this well in faith community, but it's a journey into it. Uh, secondly, you need Christian community that loves you too much just to agree with you. We have a tendency to surround... Sorry. One of the things I want to suggest, uh, Jeff was talking about it in announcements, there is a reason why we love to encourage people as, an, as a practical next step after you've been kind of part of our large church gathering for a while. We will encourage you to consider taking steps to be part of a small group or small church. Why? Because we think this is a place that you can actually get to be known and know others so that you can speak and interact with each other. We also think one of the great benefits, this is not the only way you can surround yourself with Christian community, but because you and I have a tendency to surround ourselves with, with people who see life the same way and agree with us on most things, we have a tendency to do that. Small groups, the wonderful thing is there'll always be one and two in there that don't. And it, this makes it challenging, but it also is a really, really healthy kind of a place for us to be. So we need Christian community that knows us. We need Christian community that loves us too much just to agree with us. If I could start making things like really practical, we live in a culture that's very hesitant to speak any kind of course correction words into somebody's life. Like we just, the world we live in is if people really love and accept you as you are, you should never have to change. And so as Christians, we're also very hesitant to really, man, I don't know if that's right. We, it's a really hesitant kind of a thing we want to offer into people's lives. Sometimes you and I will actually just need to ask for it. In fact, I, brief rabbit trail on it. I can't give details for this story, but I've been at West Portal for over 20 years. There are moments I would love to go back and relive because I feel like I didn't listen to God's voice well. And, and relationships were damaged and people were hurt because of decisions I made or actions I did. I don't know about you, but we often think that the, the voice of the Holy Spirit is really clear yes and no's. You want to know what the voice of the Holy Spirit more often than not has been in my life that I didn't listen to was, uh, you know, just before you do that, you should get a second and a third opinion. And the times I didn't press into that, 
are some of the times I regret the most. Sometimes you and I just need the humility to ask for honest perspective and to really hear it. And if you really want to take a threatening step, you can also jump into the fourth one here. You and I really benefit from listening to people who disagree with us. Do you really want to wrestle to remove any blinders or, or open up your perspective? It might not change your mind, but to really process something well, it'd be a little like Acts 15. Guess what? We heard from both sides on this, and they were both sides. They were not, you know, happy with each other. Ask the perspective and engage in conversation with people who disagree with you. Now, in fairness, in order to do this well, that trust and relationship component really has to be high. You have to feel a safety with the people that you're doing this with. I feel like in a small way, we had a chance, we, as a staff team, this past Tuesday morning, we had a really hard conversation, and we were not going to walk out of the room unanimous. There was no way to do it. And it was emotionally laden, it was a hard one, and it needed to happen. And I was so grateful for the chance to have that conversation in a context of six people that know that we have each other's backs, know we love each other, and won't necessarily always see eye to eye on something, and that we have to find a way forward with this. So four ideas, I don't know, like practically speaking, but when you find yourself wrestling with a life situation or how to respond to, you know, your children or, or new chapters in life or opportunities that are opening or job changes that you're considering, these are wonderful opportunities not just to be in Scripture and not just to be in prayer, but to consider pressing into the voice of those around you, Christian community that can speak into your life, that helps us process and gives us a much more stable foundation on which to sit. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your great love, for the gift of your presence, and perhaps maybe most of all, we are so grateful and thank you, thankful that your Holy Spirit delights to speak into our hearts and lives. Thank you for the gift of Scripture that reveals your heart and your character that points us in the direction of what's right and corrects us when we're wrong. Thank you for the gift of prayer, that there's this, this affirmation, this quiet sense of peace and direction that your Holy Spirit can nudge into our hearts and lives. Give us the discipline, the perseverance to press into your word, to press into those moments of creating space, not just to speak to you, but to hear from you in and through prayer. And thank you for the gift of faith family. I had someone say to me once, the only problem with the church is that it's made up of people. So thank you for the gift of faith family uh, and for people that aren't just like us and that see life differently and have different gifts given to you for our benefit and for a blessing that, yeah, give us the grace to walk richly in relationship with each other, to risk being vulnerable uh, in these places, and to really open our ears in pockets and, and where we need to hear, and not just what we want to hear, but to hear and to process well. Continue to give us unity as, as a faith family. May your spirit be alive and active and present in your church. And we pray that certainly for West Portal, but we pray that for struggling faith families across our our city and our province and our country and the world today, uh, not just because of COVID, but because of persecution and different things. The church is your outpost in this world. Give us the grace and the humility, the tenacity, the courage to be found faithful and effective to your calling in our lives. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.